This Women's History Month, Girl Security is highlighting women in technology and cybersecurity. And of course, the forefront of policy and security concerns in technology is artificial intelligence. So how can lawmakers, corporations, and society allow for ethical development while still encouraging innovation in AI? Hello, my name is Sally Brown, a Girl Security Community member. And today I have the privilege of speaking with Ms. Tina Huang, an advisor to the Girl Security Organization and currently the Director of Strategic Initiatives at Equal AI to help us answer this question. Before we begin the discussion, can you describe more about your role at Equal AI and the goals of the organization? Of course. Well, first, thank you for having me. Super excited to be doing this interview. Um, happy to jump into a little bit of background on Equal AI, my role there. So Equal AI was founded in 2018 with the goal of mitigating bias and other harm stemming from the development and use of AI. Um, and so my role here is to basically uh, create and scale different programs and initiatives um, that help achieve this goal. So Equal AI works with three main audiences. Um, first is industry, second is policymakers, and third um, are lawyers. And so some of the things that I've been working on is scaling up our badge program where we bring together senior level executives from cross sector companies to really talk about how you know bias in the world uh, translates into AI, how to make sure that AI is safe to launch within their company, um, what lawyers should be concerned about as AI presents new liabilities in different spaces, what the policy horizon looks like, um, and et cetera. And so uh, I'm really looking for opportunities to elevate um, different voices in this, in this field, as well as connecting different sectors to one another. So making sure that um, the public sector is talking to the private sector and really um, having productive conversations that help both sides understand how to govern and develop this new technology responsibly. Um, so yeah, hopefully that gives a good overview of Equal AI and what I'm doing here. Absolutely perfect. Okay, so regarding Equal AI's focus on trust, could you expand on the importance of self-regulation within companies and how this will contribute to developing this trust in AI? Sure. Um, so I would say, you know, Congress can only do so much to incentivize or penalize companies um, when it comes to responsible AI governance. And so for companies, you know, there's always the bottom line of making sure that they're always earning a profit over whatever their business model is. And part of that is ensuring that they're earning and maintaining trust with their partners, with their consumers, um, and really folks that they're working with and ensuring that their brand maintains, you know, integrity. And so by you know, being proactive and self-regulating on AI, companies are building that trust. They're earning that trust. They're showing folks, hey, like we are leveraging this new technology, but we also want to ensure that we're doing it safely, that we're not going to launch or use um, a, a tool that might put folks at harm, that might, you know, have unintended consequences, um, and just show that they are aware of the harms that could stem from AI and that they're proactively trying to mitigate those harms. Um, and when these harms or biases do pop up, they have an action plan of what to do um, once those, those issues pop up. And so um, by self re regulating, sorry, <laughs> they get um they get the opportunity to build trust, which is crucial to any company's ability to, you know, operate successfully in their field. And regarding this fear, there's been discussion in Congress and at the local level. So what role uh, does the government play in regulating AI and how necessary is government to regulating and controlling AI? That's a really, really good question. I think, you know, a lot of people are asking this. Um, if I had to narrow it down to like government's role in regulating AI, I would say um, it's two priorities. It's one, making sure 
that um, they are protecting American citizens. So ensuring that AI is benefiting um, humanity and not harming, or if there are harms that they're doing everything they can to mitigate these potential harms. And then two, ensuring the integrity of elections. Um, I think that fits squarely in you know, the government's purview to ensure that AI is not undermining any electoral processes. And if anything, AI is being used to strengthen democracy. Um, and I would also say, you know, regulating AI is not just the government's job. I mean, I think every sector has a role to play. Um, and so I say, yes, it is necessary that you know, the government is regulating in this space, but we should not be only relying on the government to regulate this space. Um, I think it's going to take one, a whole of government approach, but then all sectors need to be involved. With the ongoing development of AI, concerns about the impact on creativity, innovation, and employment have been raised. How do you see AI being utilized to enhance the work of individuals rather than displacing human skill? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of fear around AI displacing workers, but really I see AI as augmenting human capabilities. So AI can be used to free up time and energy for humans to do um, what they do best, which is critical thinking and creativity. Um, there are so many, you know, administrative tasks or more mundane tasks that take up a lot of time that AI can help cut down that time um, with, you know, human in the loop to ensure that that work is being done, you know, accurately. But it really frees up a lot of time for many folks to think critically about their roles and what they're doing. Um, I, I think it can be applied, like, for example, I think in the national security space, you know, an analyst at the National Geospatial Agency might spend hours upon hours, you know, looking at different images, trying to identify patterns. That's something that AI can help them sift through so that the analyst instead can analyze the patterns that the AI has identified or um, just have fresher eyes when looking at these different images because they aren't, you know, spending hours upon hours just sifting through it all themselves. And so mm -hmm. um, it really lets humans do what they do best that AI can't necessarily do yet, which is um, critically analyze or critically think about certain things with the context that a human would know, but an AI might not. Should there be concern for an eventual ability for AI to have this ability to critical, critically think the same way people do? I think that's what a lot of um, AI developers are aiming to, you know, achieve with AI, um, where AI, would it would be um, artificial general intelligence. So like an AI can do the same tasks that a human can do at, you know, the same level or better. Uh, and if you ask folks in this space, you know, how long do we have until AI can actually um, do exactly what a human can do, you're going to get so many different timeframes like, oh, in the next five years or next hundred years. So I think that that is a possibility down the line. I'm not sure how close it is, um, but there are things that, again, even if AI can, you know, fulfill critical thinking or creativity skills that humans normally do, there is um, the care economy that the AI AI can simply just not fulfill. So that's you know human connection. Um, like if you look at you know the elderly population. There are so many like tools that have been introduced to help them, like if they need medication, if they need help going somewhere, um, they can like use an iPad to like call for help. But if you ask them, most of them say like the thing that I want most is just being able to talk to a human. Um, and that's something that I don't see AI really replacing. Even if there are chat bots, I think like the human to human physical interaction is something that humans crave. It's in our nature. Um, and so in that sense, I can see the care economy really booming in the future. That human element just can't be replaced, it seems. Mm -hmm. 
In an ideal world, how do you see employers and employees collaborating to craft a corporate culture that promotes responsible AI use and supports the well-being of both employees and society as a whole? Definitely. I would say to start with any responsible AI culture that any organization is trying to build, you really need leadership buy-in. Um, that is necessary because even if you know all employees are trying to push forward a responsible AI program or framework, um, unless like the leadership buys in, it's going to be really hard to implement and prioritize simply because if leadership doesn't buy in, then there's not going to be a lot of resources or time and energy put into ensuring the success of any sort of responsible AI efforts. So definitely you want leaders who believe in this. Um, I would also say two of the main components of successful responsible AI uh, programs really emphasize transparency and accountability. So just making sure that things are well documented, um, that you know you can trace who was responsible for what in any part of the AI life cycle. Um, and that another important aspect I really want to emphasize is that it's a safe culture and environment for people to own up to any failures or mistakes and that people don't fear, you know, being reprimanded or facing negative consequences if they find a mistake or find an error or they're too scared to report it. Um, you really need to foster a culture where, you know, it's encouraged for folks to raise these issues because if you ignore them and brush them under the rug, they're only going to get worse down the line. And I think it's also important to recognize, you know, mistakes or failures isn't necessarily any one person's fault. Like these things just happen, especially in AI. Like there's no such thing as a perfect AI system. And so there shouldn't be this fear surrounding what you know, what a successful AI system looks like. Um, and so I would say those things are definitely like crucial for responsible AI use that will benefit, you know, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, employees, but society as a whole, because if companies are being intentional with responsible AI, then that down the line will ensure that the products that are being put out there um, have already been vetted or um, meticulously, you know, uh, review to ensure that it won't, or there's less likelihood of it causing harm. Can you elaborate on what transparency might look like in a company? Sure. So it could look like, um, like a model card, for example. So, um, an AI system where you can see what data it was trained on, how the data was collected, um, you know, who designed the algorithm, um, you know, what, like, how long was it trained for its testing results. So just a place where anyone can go and kind of see um, every step that went into building this model, um, and then the individuals involved in each step. Uh, and so that way, you know, down the line when, you know, post-deployment evaluation comes around and they see this issue of like, oh, this model didn't give an output that we wanted or mm -hmm. whatever it might be, they might be able to like trace it back. Um, and again, it's, you know, nobody's fault, but it's a good way to be able to go back and ask questions or review um like the processes that were in place, how can they be improved? But just, you know, openly sharing all the steps that went into building any given model. Okay. Um, in the white paper released by Equal AI, creating unbiased AI systems is emphasized. Can you provide an can you provide an example of how data, algorithms, or human decisions can be evaluated to ensure fairness and minimize bias in AI systems? Yeah, so this kind of goes back to my previous um, answer, but I just wanted to, you know, note that there's no such thing as a perfect AI system um, or like a perfectly unbiased AI system, uh, but you can always be intentional and meticulous when developing these systems. And so, um, like I said before, I think transparency, documentation, and accountability are 
absolutely crucial. Um, I'm not sure if I can think of an exact example of, um, I mean, I'm sure it's just not on the top of my head right now. Um, but I think like efforts that could be done uh, to ensure, you know, that there's fairness and and bias and minimizing bias in AI systems is once again, like just documenting everything that's happening. Like, like I mentioned, like who's collecting the data, how was it collected? When was it collected? Where was it collected? You know, how long was the system trained for having all of these, um, you know, steps laid out and documented. And then also um, constantly asking everyone who's part of the AI life cycle should always ask like, for whom could this technology fail? And like really think about um, like, not only how is this tool going to be used for its purpose for good, but also how could someone use this for malicious intent? Or like, how could this have second, third, fourth order effects? Um, and so, and this kind of gets into more of the human element of it, but you know, there should be a multidisciplinary approach to developing AI systems. So you're going to have your, you know, engineers and those folks, data scientists who are obviously involved in building these tools, but you should also have, you know, economists, um, you know, sociologists, mm -hmm. uh, lawyers, and just other professionals in this space who can give you like a greater perspective of like, well, if you deploy this AI system in this community, you're likely going to, you know, see X, Y, and Z happen to this population, which uh, may not be ideal, you know, and like being aware of these risks um, that might not be as obvious uh, from in like at the surface level. And so making sure that, um, all perspectives are represented. And then also humans are always biased. Like we're all biased, whether we like it or not. And so I think the best way to mitigate that is um, through different types of trainings and also um, like having humans who actively self-interrogate, you know, their biases and just being aware of them, I think is the best that you can do when it comes to, you know, humans and AI systems. Um, hopefully that is, there's something in there that can be helpful. I know I just rambled on a little bit. No, that makes complete sense to understand the biases that go into AI. We have to first hold a mirror to ourselves and question mm -hmm. what we consider uh, our, our own biases. Yep. Um, yeah. And diversity of thought is clearly an important part, which allows me to my, my next point. Um, what is the role of education and training in increasing the participation of diverse groups and of young people in the field of AI? Definitely. I think now more than ever, it's becoming very clear that um, young people, like AI is going to be transforming the world, whether you like it or not. <laughs> And so you might as well uh, be a part of that process. Um, I think it's going to best serve humanity if everyone participates, especially young people. Um, and, you know, when people think about bringing young people into um, AI or STEM, they're thinking of like, oh, we need to like train them so that they know how to build and code AI systems. And that is important. And I think that, um, you know, curriculum like that should be introduced earlier in our education system just to pique the interest of students who might be um, open to going and now going down that path. But also, you know, participating in AI doesn't have to mean that you are a computer scientist. I think it means like also educating yourself to understand AI enough to know what it can and cannot do. Um, and when you understand, you know, the AI strengths and weaknesses, then you can then be aware of the risks involved with, you know, interacting with AI systems. Um, and that helps you better calibrate trust in an AI system. So there's always a risk of over-trusting or under-trusting technology. Um, and if you don't know how a technology works, it's hard for you to gauge how much you should trust it. And so I think at the bare minimum, young people should at least be educating themselves on um, ways that AI can fail um, so that they know if they're using AI for something, you know, 
that there could be errors with it, that, you know, that in the end, they should use their best judgment of how they understand the world and whatever, you know, topic they're working on to make their own decision in the end. And AI is just there to help you. Um, but, you know, you should not blindly trust this technology, at least not in the present day. Yeah, I recently spoke to an expert in uh, disinformation and in, in the age of AI, and she basically said the, the same thing, that in the age of AI, the only protection that we have is our own ability to discern truth from falsehood. And I, I feel like that kind of aligns with what you're saying. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, so for a young woman interested in pursuing a career in AI and AI policy work, what advice would you offer to help her? Yeah, I would say, it's funny, I think about what my mentor has told me um, going into the AI policy space. It's such a new and expanding space, like a lot, like every job I've had up until this point was the first time that job really existed. And so I really don't know what I might be doing down the road because it might not exist right now. I think like, you know, the AI policy world to pursue a career here, my mentor said, it's kind of like a choose your own adventure. <laughs> You know, like situation in other careers, there might be more of a clear cut, like, you know, if you want to go into the intelligence community, you become an analyst and then you, you know, rise the ranks through that. Or if you want to work on the Hill, you start off as an intern, you become, you know, a legislative assistant and you build your way up from there. In AI, it's kind of like, oh, there's no clear path. Um, there are different opportunities that are just like popping up, but there's no like, oh, you start here and then you build your way up and eventually you'll end up in this role. And so I would say um, my advice is just follow the opportunities or pursue an opportunity that you that you just find interesting in the moment. And like, don't overthink about like, well, if I do this, what am I going to do after? And like, will this set me up for this job? And like, I don't think that's really possible right now in the AI policy space to think that far ahead. Um, and this is advice I have to tell myself too, because I like to plan ahead, but I know I can't, it's just simply not possible. I, I know mm -hmm. that the job I'm probably going to have is something that doesn't exist right now. And so the only thing you can do is just take jobs that you find interesting, that you're passionate about, and just really give it your all um, and just kind of put faith into um, knowing that that is going to take you down the right path. Um, there's one quote I like to think of, which is, it sounds really corny. It's probably going to be really corny, but, um, you can only see as far as your headlights, but you can make the whole journey that way. And so that's kind of how I view my career and also just, I guess, generally things in life, which is you can only really see right in front of you, like what you're going to be doing, but, you know, you can still make it through your whole career just seeing what's right in front of you. And sometimes that's for the best because you might be open to opportunities that you didn't consider before um, in like a five-year plan unless you just focus on the here and now. That is excellent advice. Um, thank you, Tina, for all your insight and devotion to girl security and its mission to encourage and educate young women in the security studies field. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been of course. a lot of great questions.